today I would like to talk about uh, how the Sonia file system can be used to distribute <coughs> complex application uh, stacks to HPC compute nodes. Um, CERN is the European uh, lab laboratory for, for particle physics, so first and foremost we care about physics, but these particle detectors generate a lot of data, so we also care about computing. And uh, so I would like to start a little bit, paint the landscape, uh, what are our computing challenges, that uh, explains the, how our scientific sto software stacks look like, and we believe at least I have seen this in, in, in other scientific fields too. It's uh, perhaps a bit bigger than average, but the anatomy of the scientific software sex is often very similar. Um, I would like to speak about the key concepts uh, of the CERN VM file system and the specific points we have addressed when it comes to HPC uh, systems and supercomputers. That is a bird's eye view of uh, you see the dimensions of the Large Hadron Collider. The Large Hadron Collider is our flagship, um, uh, flagship particle collider. What you see here is a, are the, uh, it's a countryside, the outskirts of Geneva, uh, with the Geneva airport here, and uh, the, the dimensions of the LHC in this ring, and the actual um, lab is this year, in the background you see the Jura Mountains in France. So it's 27 kilometers in circumference and depending on the terrain, uh, 50 to 150 meter underground. Um, it's not only the machine, but uh, once you can collide particles, you would like to measure what happens. And to do this, you operate uh, a few quite large particle detectors. So that is a picture of one of the particle detectors, the LS detector, and as a frame of reference you see here a technician. Um, in, in fact, there are more technicians hidden in this picture, so for your entertainment you can try this problem. Um, this picture probably is the most accurate visualization of our software as well. So it's, it's <laughs> deeply layered, um, with lots of moving parts, Nevertheless, things have, have to work precisely uh, in, in order to get correct physics out of it. Um, in a more schematic view, um, this is what happens uh, when we have particles colliding inside the detector. Uh, new particles emerge and we would like to, to measure the results and, and gather the data. And we speak of these um, well, collision products uh, as events, so that is our jargon. The, the central data structure we work on is, is the event. And you, you can see it as a sort of a digital camera. So we work on lots of, of pictures, on millions of pictures. Um, there are, there's a wide range of different computing tasks that we do based on this data. Some are computer intensive, some are I.O. intensive, some are both. An important ingredient is that we are inherently data parallel. So each of these collisions is independent from each other. And perhaps in contrast to other traditional HPC applications, uh, it allows us to follow um, a straightforward parallelization scheme where the, the, the most cost-effective way to do computing is to uh, buy commodity hardware, lots of it, uh, and then to distribute uh, over lots of, of commodity servers. And what the high energy physics community at the moment has at their disposal is something around 800,000 uh, Xeon cores and um, close to an exabyte of storage, half of it on disk, half, the other half on tape, roughly. Um, so all of this is not being done exclusively at CERN, but it is really like many things in energy physics, uh, a community-driven, a collaborative approach uh, with many participating um, physics institutes, universities, research organizations. Um, they build the particle detector in a collaboration, but they also build the software in, in, in a collaboration. Um, and you have the computing distributed as well. 
the, the way it usually works is that the universities that participate in the physics program also contribute a part of their data center, share of the data center to the computing, which leads to this picture where roughly 170 sites around the world contribute to the computing. 20% uh, is done at CERN and the rest is done elsewhere. And these centers come in all sizes, from half a rack to uh, 100,000 cores. Different countries, different institutions, different platforms, so it's heterogeneous. Um, it is the traditional high throughput computing environment. However, um, we reach out into other environments as well, in particular cloud computing. And since a couple of years, um, a number of workflows run on the traditional um, real supercomputers, if you will. Um, and and for, the, for the supercomputers, our advantage, again, is the fact that we are inherently data parallel, so it works best when we run in backfill mode. What the high energy physics jobs can do, they can increase the utilization of, a, of an HPC system, where between the real HPC jobs, which come you know, in configurations with, you know, with many, say, large-scale API jobs, in between you, you can, you can um, uh, fill the, the gaps with, with HPG, a, a, um, uh, HEP, high-energy physics jobs. Um, at least for the largest HPC machines, they are so big that the gaps are a significant amount of, of computing power. Um, by the way, uh, one of these yellow dots is uh, PIC in Barcelona, which is one of the largest data centers we work with. Uh, and is the data center responsible for the, the Spanish contribution to high physics computing. So, in order to, to do something useful with all these resources, with all these machines, we have to bring the software onto them. And if you look at how the software looks like, um, so that is, I think, the physicist's view uh, on the software. Um, you see this, this acronym CMS, is one of the experiments at CERN. And uh, the, the physicists, uh, the, the analysis groups, they will care about uh, specific analysis um, algorithms that they might have developed in Python, which is, say, order of 10 Python classes. Um, something that is developed in the course of a few weeks, a few months. Now, that is the very tip of the iceberg uh, of the software. In order for this code to run, it relies on the software framework uh, of the experiment, so you, you have to have certain support for the geometry of your detector for uh, determining um, systematic uncertainties uh, for your data model, uh, I.O. and so on. All of this comes from the software framework, which is order of a few thousand C++ classes. So it means a few millions of lines of code developed over the last 20 years or so, which in turn relies on, on certain base libraries, um, root, is our workhorse for data analysis, in part similar to R, um, simulation libraries, and so on. And all of this runs on Linux, and from the Linux system, again, we require perhaps order of 100 base libraries. <laughs> um, so some key figures, this, this software stack, in part, is as complex as it is, because we would like to give the, the physicists, the novice developers up here, the possibility to do their physics. So there's a lot of, of support code by more experienced developers uh, written to make that work. And so overall, you, you can easily have hundreds of developers involved in the software stack. Um, the biggest experiments by now have 100 million files accumulated just in software, uh, or overall versions, overall releases. Um, they can produce essentially the amount of, of integration bits. Um, at the moment, we speak about something like a terabyte per day. Um, and you do not only want to distribute the latest, greatest state of your software, but in order to ensure that you can reproduce what you have done in the past, what, what is a production release ought to be 
available essentially eternally. So the, the, the usual approach whenever we speak about software distribution, distribution is a packaging approach. Where um, one way or another we think about what we want to have and we prepackage it. Uh, for instance, if I want to use R, I would go to Docker, download the R image, um, and start running some tutorials. Um, I have an image of download of 700 megabytes. Now the key insight is that after I have run a few tutorials and I look inside the image, what did I actually use? It is much less um, with something in this case about 30 megabytes, but it's a, a small fraction of what is available. And often we don't know up front which fraction it is because it depends on the tutorial I do if I need this part of the software or that part. So that um, kind of app store model that, is, uh, that works very well for, for mobile applications. Um, and it is, by, by the way, it's great for the developers, but it's hard to scale to data centers where images can easily reach a gigabyte, maybe 10 gigabytes, they change every day for a running experiment. Um, and also, when we start distributed <coughs> workflows, all of our servers need the same software at the same time. So we have really bad timing um, and, and a problem with flash cards. Um, so this is just this is an example with Docker, but you can replace the word Docker by a virtual machine or, or uh, you know, Debian or RPM packages. Essentially, the problem is when we package, we package too much. So what is the often used approach, at least in, in scientific data centers, is a shared software area. Where is that? I put <coughs> all the files, all the software I care about on a distributed file system. And by having it on a file system, <coughs> automatically I only touch and need to load exactly the files and the byte ranges uh, that are really required. Um, typically, the, the problem with this shared file system, a shared software area on a distributed file system, is that most of the file systems uh, have a hard time dealing with this particular workload of software distribution, where you have a very metadata-heavy workload, a tiny volume, but lots of individual objects. For instance, if you start a large, for instance, for one of our um, experiments, uh, it comes with. 800 shared libraries, uh, and you need to look them up uh, one by one. And there are perhaps tens of search paths. So that, that uh, <coughs> explodes, and you have um, something perhaps like a megahertz of metadata requests, a kilohertz of file open requests, and uh, a beautiful, uh, beautifully designed distributed denial of service attack. And that is particularly acute for the HPC file systems because they are tuned for the fast parallel writing of, of large files. So we had, uh, the, one, you know, we had the, the, the first reports of problems with users of Luster, uh, where it worked otherwise very well just for the software case. Um, it didn't work so well. Um, so <coughs> at this point, we thought this approach is actually very nice. If only we had a file system engineered for this particular problem, and the, the main trick to, to get around this issue here is to do lots of caching on all the, on the individual nodes, essentially to cover all the load within each node. So that brings us to the Serbian file system. Um, this is the uh, coarse grade picture of the file systems, file system, and, and uh, there are some essential ingredients in it. The first Essential ingredient is that it's an asymmetric file system. Reading is not the same as writing. In fact, we can almost only read. And we have a single point of publishing instead of writing. Um, the single point of publishing, in the end, turns out to be a web server, where all the data is available. And through a caching hierarchy of um, web servers and web caches, data is brought to clients, where on the client side, um, the, the, Sermian, uh, the Sermian file system mounts what you can see under like a virtual slash CDMFS directory tree. It is a fuse file system, 
um, so Fuse is this uh, kernel uh, facility in Linux where you have a stub implementation of a file system and all the actual logic you, you uh, implement as a user space module. And that has certain advantages, in particular, it allows us to do a rapid development and it's quite safe, we can crash the kernel. Um, there's a little bit of a performance penalty here, but in our case this doesn't hurt so much, in particular because we are not really throughput oriented. Um, so if you look at the caching, uh, in this picture you have, in the end, the, the hottest the hot set of metadata is cached by, by each of the compute nodes uh, Linux kernel, a few megabytes. Then you have a, a, a software cache on the local hard drive of the compute nodes, which perhaps is a gigabyte or two or perhaps a few more. And what you have as an overall volume is still not so large. It's usually of the order of a few terabytes, but in many small files. So, in the end-to-end -end picture, uh, what is happening is, when you want to write, um, it is a transactional process where changes are made temporarily, and on a certain stage, once you're happy, for instance, once a new version uh, is completely ready uh, to be published, uh, like in a versioning system, there's kind of a commit and push step, which transforms everything that has been written into an internal object, into an internal storage format, content addressed objects and, and Merkle trees, so very similar to the Git uh, internal uh, format. And that allows us to uh, have to solve two smaller problems instead of one big problem. The two smaller problems are how do we mount uh, these file systems um, based on a bag of immutable, independent objects. And so everything we produce in this internal format is um, uh, are immutable files, so it makes it very easy to cache them. We don't have to care about stale caches, cache expiry, and so on. Uh, and they are independent of each other. So I can go for every single object and just look anywhere on any of the web caches, any of the web servers. If it's there, fine. If not, I have to look somewhere else. And so these problems can now be solved independently. Um, to to um, walk you a bit through the, through the this, uh, published process, as I said, we actually can only read, we cannot write. So how, how is this solved? Well, in the same way that it's solved on, on Docker, where you have a read, uh, you know, read-only branch of, of your the layers that you download, and for your local modifications, you use a union file system and put a local writable file, local writable directory on top. Um, <coughs> and once all the changes are ready to be committed and pushed, a CDMFS server tool uh, that is installed on this release manager machine walks through the writable directory tree, uh, picks up the change set, and commits it to the final storage. And the final storage, in the simplest case, is a directory that is served by an Apache server, or it can then uh, become more complicated with, with more uh, replication and caching, or it can go into an S3 system. Uh, this can be Ceph S3, or it can be an Amazon uh, commercial S3, so anything that speaks uh, S3. Right, and as in Git, you can, whenever you call this publish command, you can come back to the state. Um, in fact, there's even there's a hidden directory .cdmfs slash snapshots where you can explore the previous uh, states of your software. Um, so this conceptually is this one single publisher. It has been for a while a physical single node in every case. Recently, we published we, we released a version where you can have multiple of these publisher nodes running in, in parallel. But like conceptually, it's still a single point of publishing for many reasons. So for the content distribution, uh, that is the point where you are free to engineer it to your needs. But this shows the picture how it's done on, on most of the sites we know about, um, where you have um, your local compute nodes with a local cache. You have a number of web caches on site. 
for instance, at CERN, we run five virtual machines for 10,000 or so servers. And you can have a number of mirror servers that uh, usually are geographically distributed. Uh, we have at the moment for, for LHC computing, two in the US, two in Europe, and one in Asia. Uh, yes, so that is the network of, uh, of mirror servers and web caches we run for LHC computing. Uh, the software has been in production since 2010. And last time I counted from all we know, it's uh, more than a million files under management. Um, there are users within and beyond physics. And some first examples of industry adoption, actually one of the first uh, examples was presented at this conference last year. Um, and since a few years, we have HPC deployments. For instance, one runs at Pete's Dent at the Swiss Supercomputing Center, the, the current number three. Uh, supercomputer. Uh, we have colleagues at NERSC who deployed it on Cori um, and in Munich at the Leibniz Rechenzentrum uh, the SuperMOOC. Right, so these are the areas where this file system is best used and where we, where we would like to shine. Production software um, likely builds in continuous integration. Uh, that means we have to have a garbage collection that is used for the nightly bits because there you don't want to keep everything, you want to clean up after a week or so. <coughs> Container images, the important point here is to have them extracted, to forget about the image as one big file, but to store the contents of the image in extracted form on the file system. That is where it works best. And it works out of the box with singularity. Um, we have a connection to Docker. We are looking into a connection to Container D, um, and we are working currently on the on converting images from Docker into CDMFS in an easy way. And auxiliary data. So these, in our case, these are not the main collision data, but kind of <laughs> data products you also need to do some work. For instance, the state of the detector at the time of data taking, gas pressure and temperature, and so on. Okay, just a little bit about specific problems on HPC nodes. Um, to the extent that the supercomputer looks like a standard Linux cluster, there are very little problems. If, uh, if you can mount fuse, if there is a local um, disk, and there is a TCP IP connection to web caches, everything ought to be smoothly. Um, so our main issues that we encountered when we were trying to, to, to get to academic HPC systems is that perhaps there is no disk, or there is no connectivity, or we cannot mount fuse. Um, and some of them have really no standard distributions, although that is our smallest problem. Um, the code usually compiles on anything. Uh, it's ported to Raspberry Pi and uh, to Red Hat Linux 4 and to many uh, systems. Just to let you know, we have this summer a development program to uh, <coughs> solve it in the most brutal way if necessary. So, in particular in the US, we have some systems where really you only can come with your image container file and nothing else. And, okay, in this case we have to somehow bulk export data from slash CDMFS into a container. That is like a fallback solution which we wouldn't necessarily recommend, but if all other things fail, um, we are working on that. Um, some things you have developed when you are in a disconnected mode is a, is a preloader. So the idea, so that is how it looks, looked like on the HPC systems we saw, um, where compute nodes only have access to the shared file system, and there is a login node that has access to the shared file system and to the internet. So from this login node, we can pre-populate the cache from the shared file system, the CDMFS cache. And um, once it's pre-populated, <coughs> there are no cache misses. Compute nodes don't need connectivity. Um, so that the, the, the population is pretty efficient. Uh, it is more efficient than an RSync. Once, so the, the incremental steps usually go in a few seconds. But of course, you, you, you will have noticed that we introduced the very problem we tried to solve, we have put lots of small files on GPFS and Luster to be accessed by all these compute nodes. So to make the scale, we combined it with a pluggable 
cache, where instead of the CDMFS client cache just accessing a directory on a shared file system, this cache access has been factored out in a C library. Uh, and from there, many things can be done. So one of the things we, we did is an in-memory cache. Uh, and then we have developed prototype caches for, for various other storage systems. And what we have done at Pitsland in, in Lugano, that uh, there's a preloaded cache on GPFS, and on every compute node, an upper layer cache for the hot set in memory. So most of the requests are again being taken care of by the individual compute nodes, and only every now and then uh, you need to populate from GPFS. Uh, Parrot is a really uh, nice, interesting uh, tool from the University of Notre Dame. Um, and this is something we can use when we are not allowed to mount views. It works a little bit like GDB. So you can sandbox your application in Parrot. And uh, Parrot will rewrite all the system calls and allows you to do stuff. And you can give the illusion that the application sees slash CDMFS. Um, and in this way, make a specific application CDMFS aware. It comes with a small performance penalty, but it has been a really neat trick, and it's how we run on, uh, in Munich, on the supermarket. <coughs> yes, there's an alternative solution, also not really recommended, but it sort of works. Uh, you can take one client and re-export it via NFS or create ES. But you introduce, by doing this, you introduce a single point of failure. Um, just very click, quickly, the Docker Graph Driver plugin. Um, as I said, with singularity, you just point singularity to a directory, and that works out of the box. With Docker, it's a bit more complicated. Um, so these are almost accurate uh, lines. You have, to, you have to do a few more things. You have to reload. Docker daemon and so on, but this is all in our documentation, the missing lines. Um, we did some benchmarks with a, with a Docker plugin where we run a container image in Docker from CDMFS. Actually, this was a Kubernetes benchmark where we started 90 uh, containers to do, to do work. And in the plain case, it, take, it took five minutes to distribute all the container images and actually start up the Kubernetes cluster. And when the contents of the image come from CDMFS, <coughs> uh, they start almost immediately. Um, become available almost immediately. Okay, I will skip this and come to the summary. Um, so CDMFS is a liberally licensed uh, network file system optimized for software container image distribution. Uh, we have production deployments in grids, kind of the academic precursors to clouds. Uh, and supercomputers, and uh, here are links how you can get the software, how you can join the community if you would like to uh, contribute, that would be fantastic. If you would like to use it, that is great too. Uh, please let us know, and thank you for your time. <coughs>